Hey, hi everyone. Um, nice to see people trickling in. Uh, we have we have uh, about fifteen people who've joined us. Great to have you all, uh, and thank you for spending this time uh, to explore and think through this session around uh, how we measure or track progress on on. Uh, track progress of locally led adaptation and using tools like the resilience platform that we've been talking about for a while now. Uh, so welcome, and I'm Shruti. I am a program officer at GRP, where I lead the shared learning component of the Global Resilience Partnership, and I coordinate the Resilience Knowledge Coalition. So as a quick welcome. Uh, I shall share a little bit about the Knowledge Coalition, like one slide uh, about the Knowledge Coalition, and then uh, we'll, without further ado, we'll hand over to the rest of the speakers. So, right, so just very quickly, this is this is what the Resilience Knowledge Coalition is, and we are, we, it's a, it's a network of networks that uh, being co-led by three organizations, ACAD, CDKN, and the Global Resilience Partnership. And we'll, we have, today we have uh, representation from all three organizations, but Emma uh, from CDKN is going to talk about uh, some of the work we've done together in the past um, in a little more detail. So we are a network of networks, which means we are filling in the gap uh knowledge brokering networks and initiatives, existing initiatives have uh, sort of been conducting and we, we feel like we are uh, adding value by 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 actually enlarging that that whole and, and enlarging that whole as larger than the sum of its parts. And so we are focused on a, on a few different things. One of course, getting knowledge used and uh, facilitating that knowledge into action uh, framework where uh, knowledge where it sits is used in policy plans and investments. Um, we are a community of practice of over 560 members now, and we work in a few different ways. Um, one, uh, we, we convene. So we have we have uh, convenings like we had for the resilience measurement. Uh, we had we have been thinking about resilience measurement for a while now, for about two years since uh, Gobashona in 2021, uh, and then again Gobashona this year, and then we convened a workshop in person meeting with um, USAID and University of Arizona. We came out with collective principles and priorities at that workshop, but then. Uh, and and this is that report. But then we also synthesize that information in easy to digest uh, formats like blogs. Uh, we did webinars on it, uh, and we've been using the resilience platform, which Linda, my colleague, will talk about uh, a little later. And we've also been along with that working with uh, small brands. Uh, grassroots organizations in various different ways um, around their stories and, and surfacing their stories um, with respect to uh, ensuring that knowledge is being used and measuring tracking progress in a way that uh, in a way that they are comfortable. So uh, without much further ado, I shall stop sharing screens and I shall hand over to our next speaker. Uh, please welcome Joan, who will we'll do the Mentimeters, and Joan, here, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Shruti. I've sent a link to the Mentimeter in the chat, so uh, please, uh, you, can, you can click the link, and it will take you directly to um, to this to this Mentimeter. So, so uh, this this uh, this Mentimeter is just like a way to break, sort of break the ice and just uh, also like have a collective thinking for everyone to see like where we are in terms of like just understanding like uh, how we track our progress. So, yeah, we have two questions, and and for this, there's no like a wrong and right answer. So, just like based on what you you based on your experience, your work, and what you're thinking, just feel free to to add your thoughts there. So, the first question is, how do you think we should track our adaptation actions in com uh, in communities to know the impact that you're making, like or 
maybe you could just add how you do it or or or, or maybe the ideas that you have uh, from your own experiences yeah feel free to to write uh, any 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 question Ah, nice social economic factors, uh -huh. health impacts, qualitatively. Oh, that's that's uh, that's interesting. Yes. Um, uh, document oh, documentary films. Oh, that's that's so cool. Um, interviews, surveys. Oh, a lot of subjective impression. Okay. Before and after hazards, yeah, I think I think that's that's a like a really um, um oh wow <laughs> wow we are, we are getting we are getting uh yeah yeah keep uh, yeah keep uh, dropping your vlogs yes storytelling uh -huh. participatory impact I guess it's monitoring. Behavioral change, wow, yeah. Regeneration of agriculture. Okay, I think now we'll, we'll go to the next question. Um, so the next question is, what are the tracking challenges in the locally adaptation, locally led adaptation in your mind? Like what challenges have you maybe experienced in, in your, like while, while doing your, your practices or, or um, just that you think about? Or, or that you've experienced through other people, or this what are these tracking challenges that you that you face? Limited finance. That is, I think that is one of uh, like a major <laughs> challenge that Malia could think of. <laughs> Better guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lack of political will is is uh, diversity of actions. Okay. It's it's nice to to see that like we, we already know like the challenges that you're facing and and like all of these challenges are are like diverse uh, like things different things that yeah language yeah and I think um, thank you I think I think should she I'll, I'll okay I think more answers are still coming in yes I think uh, you can feel free to keep on adding because they, there's no limit. Of the number of times you can you can add your responses, and I think Shruti, I'll, I'll stop there with this. Thank you, <laughs> super helpful. And uh, just to let you know uh, that uh, all your inputs here are not not just um, yes, they are uh, they are they are an icebreaker and and are meant for reflection where you where you think through these, but we're all so keen that they that they add on and and these are questions where we are checking pulse to um to support our colleagues who've been working on the global stock take uh contributions so uh colleagues who've been working at ara and cdkn who've been supporting the global stock take uh contributions to the unf triple c global goal on adaptation uh have have needed these inputs and are and are seeking more variety of inputs. So so we're also going to uh, share these reflections with them. So um, just to let you know that it's not it's yes it's a reflection but it's also to it's also going to contribute at some some place. So yeah, thank you. And um, with that and and I think all those contributions were brilliant. So uh, thank you very much for all of that. And with that, I will, I think, hand over to Emma uh, to give us a brief overview of the voices from the frontline work that we've done together in the past. Emma, over to you. Thanks, Suchi. Um, yeah, sorry, let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for attending our session today. Um, it's great to see all of you here. Um, as Shuchi mentioned, um, yeah, my name's Emma Baker, and um, I am the Knowledge and Global Outreach Manager for um, CDKN, which is the Climate and Development Knowledge Network. 
um, which is a program uh, it's been going for oh, many years now, <laughs> uh, started in 2010. So yeah, 12 years now. Um, and uh, we are a, a knowledge brokering um, uh, program uh, and it's based at South South North um, in South Africa. Uh, also with partners in uh, Latin America and in Asia as well. Um, so as Suchi mentioned, um, yeah, as part of the Resilience Knowledge Coalition, uh, which is a coalition between CDK and GRP and ICAD uh, in Bangladesh, um, we uh, started an initiative called Voices from the Frontline, uh, which really emerged uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic um, as a way to uh, really bring out the stories of community resilience um, to COVID and uh, the multiple hazards and shocks uh, that they were facing during the pandemic. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, so first of all, just kind of a bit of a reflection on storytelling as a technique. Um, we've been just talking about that with the Mentimeter and quite a few of you were, uh, were mentioning it um, as a technique. So I mean, storytelling um, yeah, it, it, we often think of it as, as words, uh, often written words, um, but of course it can be um, visual, audio, artistic, um, but it's really a means to capture, uh, yeah, the lived experiences of, of people and um, make abstract con concepts more um, understandable and uh, allow people to connect with them uh, through personal experience and sharing of, of personal stories. Um, and it's also a bottom-up approach. So rather than trying to fit, uh, you know, a very complex and nuanced um, experience or set of experiences into say a small set of indicators, it's actually a form of, of gathering a lot of information and um, yeah, a lot more nuance. Um, and then drawing out from those stories, uh, the lessons and the learnings um, and the experiences that can be shared and disseminated more widely. Um, so uh, the Voices from the Frontline initiative was really um, an interview series. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it did take the form of, of written, uh, written stories, um, although these were also accompanied by a lot of photographs, which uh, you'll also see during my presentation, which um, are very powerful in bringing the, the stories to, to light as well. Um, so as I mentioned, it was um, really born out of the COVID pandemic where as um, a network, we, we really saw um, not only the impacts that COVID was having on grassroots communities, but uh, the resilience and the local action and local adaptation uh, that communities were taking um, to respond to the crisis um, and also to respond to multiple crises that were happening at the same time as the COVID pandemic. So for example, uh, in this picture here, you'll see uh, there was also a cyclone in, in Bangladesh um, in the first few months of the pandemic. There have been floods across the world, multiple climate hazards and risks. And of course, the COVID pandemic also highlighted um, many structural inequalities and socioeconomic challenges um, that communities face. And uh, these were really exposed during the pandemic. Um, so the VFL stories were really a way of capturing yeah, community resilience and grassroots leadership. Um, often these were, were coming from women and youth organizations especially. Um, and we were really just trying to um, give a platform to these community voices and community actions and share them with a much broader community. So uh, how did we do this? Uh, so I mentioned it was uh, yeah, an interview series um, and we ended up gathering 50 um, stories from across the global south, mostly in Africa and South Asia. And these were published um, between June 2020 and October 2021. Um, by CDK and ICAD, and they're also featured on the GRP uh, resilience platform, which we'll hear about later in this session. Um, and yeah, so the stories really aim to document learning uh, from community practices um, and then disseminate this learning a lot more widely um, to foster greater um, and effective uh, responses to future shocks and build resilience in general. 
Um, and each story captured uh, the voice of the communities from themselves in real time using a, uh, an interviewer, which uh, were people from local NGOs, from research institutes, from labor unions, from universities uh, within our network as the Resilience Coalition. Um, so they went and they interviewed um, community members and then wrote up these, wrote up their stories um, using quotes and the photos that were taken as well. And then um, each story also had the included an interviewer's perspective where the interviewer um, actually added a paragraph at the bottom um, to give more context to the story from their point of view, maybe from um, community organization level. Um, and that also really um, enabled a deeper understanding of um, of the, the issues that the communities were facing as well as the context in which they were uh, working in and acting in. Um, so what came out? Um, lots. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that um, there were a lot of uh, women and youth-led initiatives, um, which were just really incredible. So um, a lot of these were actually um, around knowledge, sharing knowledge, um, sharing resources, including financial resources. Uh, within communities and especially disadvantaged communities. Um, and uh, these were, um, yeah, also around diversifying livelihoods. Um, you can see there's a kitchen garden or community garden. Um, people started developing seed banks to share seeds among the communities um, as well to ensure uh, food security. Um, and diversifying livelihoods through starting up business businesses, for example, um, liquid soap and mm -hmm. other um, hygiene businesses that were needed during the COVID pandemic. Um, and then also many people were um, taking it upon themselves to fight uh, misinformation, which we all know was a huge issue during the pandemic um, and delivering um, easy to understand messages and translating the science actually to the local communities in their language in ways that could be uh, understood and um, foster safe practices around hygiene, especially. Um, and then also in challenging social barriers um, such as, as gender-based violence. So you saw in one context, um, for example, a hotline was set up for domestic abuse, uh, which was, yeah, also, um, yeah, very powerful. Um, and many of these strategies were actually in place before the pandemic, but um, during, during the pandemic, this is where we saw uh, through the stories, um, a lot of innovation within these spaces, a lot of um, strengthening of relationships and new forms of local cooperation, knowledge sharing and mutual support, including financial support. Um, so, um, as a kind of follow on from publishing each story, uh, which you can find on the CDKN website, the ICAD website or GRP resilience platform. Um, we also synthesized um, these stories into um, a digi book or a synthesis report, which you can find at cdkn.org slash voices. Um, and this was really um, aiming to bring the messages uh, coming out from the stories to a broader audience, which included policymakers, uh, funding agencies, um, and yeah, development partners, um, a broad range, um, to really share um, the learnings that and the innovations that came out from these stories, um, and to um, yeah, really show that the experience and um, yeah, innovation on at the community level, which can 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 and should be invested in and scaled up um, as well. And we also then produced um, a report on um, access to finance because um, quite a few of these um, stories also highlighted the fact that um, you know local communities were really um, taking finance into their own hands and using uh, say women's uh, savings groups or, or savings and loans groups um, yeah a lot of uh, crowdfunding um, opportunities and really really innovative um, innovative techniques to um, mobilize finance for a lot of these local actions and um, to 
yeah, just take, as I said, <laughs> take uh, take into their own hands and um, ensure that um, yeah, that these actions were were being taken. Um, so I think I will leave it there. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, and uh, thanks for listening. And hand back to you, Suchi. Thanks, Emma. Um, before you, I mean, before you hand over and before we move on to conversation with uh, Frank, uh, just uh, just and in chat, because there seem to be some questions around voices from the front line. It would be great to hear from you and and your thoughts on them. So, Ritika asks. Um, if the interviewers were deliberately from the countries in which the interviews were taking place, and if you'd like to shed some light on that. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, yeah, so they definitely were, and um, actually they were mostly from the communities um, as well, and kind of the uh, community level um, organizations. Um, so they really were yeah, either part of the communities or uh, were working in that space. Um, so yes, it was, that was how it worked. <laughs> Thanks, and there's one more question. Um, did you have more or less the same structure of the interview guide? Was it contextualized probably? And would that be possible to share? And did you interview children? So a lot of questions within one question. Yes. <laughs> so maybe I could break it down. We could start with, did you have more or less the same kind of interview guide or structure? And would it be possible to share? That's one question. We can start with that. Yes. Um, yes, so we did in order to have a kind of, um, yeah, similar across all of the stories, uh, we did have um a similar structure that we followed um and we could potentially share that i will have to look into that but um if you um note down your email uh, marriage um i can get back to you on that um so yeah because we so as cdk and an icad we kind of um acted as the editors in a way of the interview sort series so um we worked with the interviewers um and then helped to also uh, write it up afterwards with them right and did you interview children is the next question um no we didn't um no <laughs> we did interview youth, uh, young people but um to my knowledge um they were all over 18 so yeah yeah i'm pretty sure that would require a different set of consent as well in terms of reaching out to parents etc so yeah we have emma's email id in chat so if you have uh if if you want more details around the questionnaire and the interview guide, uh, that's there. And then we have one more question, and I think this is the last question. Uh, did you check understanding with the interviewees after the story was stories were written down? And I think it means like validation, almost like a validation exercise. Um. Yes, um, I have to be honest here. I'm not sure what the process was between the interviewers and the interviewees after they finished their interviews. So we obviously worked with the interviewer uh, to write up and validate uh, from their perspective. But I'm afraid um, I don't know what what actually happened between the the community interviewees and the community and the interviewers. After but that. considering considering many of those interviewers were part of the same communities, I believe uh, uh, context was taken care of there in terms of uh, in terms of that exchange. So it wasn't CDKN interviewing someone in rural Bangladesh, for example, no. or you know. So yeah, exactly. No, exactly. It was definitely uh, yeah very sensitive um, and yeah within the local context. Thanks, Emma. I think that, yeah, there's, there's, I think Marit has shared his email ID, and I think that he would like to get he they would like to get in touch with you. Uh, so yeah, 
uh, great. I'm glad this is this is already leading to more conversations and, and collaboration. Um, all right. With that, uh, can I invite uh, Bright Sakwa to for a quick conversation? And Bright, uh, as a matter of introduction, has um, won the Catalytic Grants Award last year at CBA. And if you could pin Bright, that would be great, uh, Willina. Perfect, thank you. So uh, Bright is Bright has won the Catalytic Grants Award last year. ACAD, GRP, and CJRF have uh, been giving out since I think 2020, uh, 2021, uh, I believe. Yes, 2021. I'm correct on that. And um, Bright completed his uh, their their exercise and and basically we supported uh, colleagues supported colleagues at ACAD and, and uh, GRP have supported Bright in telling their story. So it would be great to hear from Bright. And so Bright, welcome. And if you could uh, just quickly start with your introduction and what your project was and, and maybe giving some context uh, to the audience, that would be great. Bright, can you hear me? Uh, You're on mute. Ah, uh, uh, thank you, Suchi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Bright Sakwa, and uh, I am one of the Catalytic Grant Awardees from CBA 15. I uh, was awarded with a colleague known as Susan Nandudu. Some of you might have seen her somewhere. So our project focused on uh, refugees in a camp who were not also spared when it came to the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, the food supplies uh, significantly reduced, which led to hunger and malnutrition. So uh, the situation is that when the refugees come in, when they are relocated to the country, the government offers them small pieces of land where they can do agriculture. And this is usually intended to supplement the food aid they receive from uh, uh, development partners and humanitarian supporters. Unfortunately, uh, most of the refugees uh, don't go ahead to do the agriculture on the small pieces of land given. So they mainly depend on uh, the food aid, uh, which reduced during this period. And uh, we really can't blame them because they come from different contexts. Some of them are pastoralists. They are not using to growing crops. So we don't really blame them. And then for the few who do the agriculture, they are also again not spared by climate change disasters. So uh, we looked into this and we thought we could have an intervention of encouraging agriculture among the refugees, but most importantly, agriculture, which is adaptive to the changing climate. That's great. That, um, it's actually a very, um, very pertinent and very, uh, in, in some ways, very inspiring that you thought of doing something for this. And, and so thank you for sharing that. Um, and it also gives some context into what what the plurality of issues, complexity of issues of the nested challenges that that community space could be, uh, and therefore the need to be flexible in the way we think about and implement and and measure uh, locally led adaptation. So thanks for that. But uh, Bright, can you share a little bit more about uh, the story? And I can I can actually share the story in chat. Uh, the link to the story, and and maybe you can share a little bit about how you went about building it. Yes. You're on mute again. Yeah, back. 
Yes, so apart from the funding, we also benefited a lot in terms of knowledge uh, from uh, ICAD, uh, GRP, and the Climate Justice Resilience Fund because uh, they trained us about uh, storytelling as a powerful tool of communicating your impact as well as uh, tracking progress. So uh, we were guided on how we can come up with a story. And indeed, uh, we came up with uh, a blog, which uh, builds the scenario and also paints a picture of what really uh, the communities are going through. And uh, also goes ahead to show uh, what we did. Our story uh, actually had a tool which uh, ended at a suspense because after training, we then took a break. And uh, currently, we now have the full impact of what the project had on the community and uh, the lessons learned, the challenges faced, and the call to action. So uh, this kind of tracking progress, uh, I find it really nice because it's not concealed to a few people, but it's there for all stakeholders to follow since it is uh, on an online platform and information can be gotten by everyone who wishes. And I think it's a good way of uh, being accountable also on what you really did and to enable people follow up on that. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and this, in, in some ways, this wasn't our way of holding you accountable, but this was really you being accountable to the communities, right? Uh, in, in terms of uh, the kind of work you were doing. Yes. Perfect. Great. So yeah, so just, just um, getting into what were your, what were the different sort of paths? your story and if you could just highlight that and if you could uh, let everyone know that know how you sort of the process of, of building this story yeah so uh first of all we had to build the scenario uh to look at the context where we are implementing the project which is a refugee camp in this case uh it's good to let people know uh the context you're dealing with and the kind of people in this case we are dealing with people from different backgrounds so there's a lot to put into consideration unlike uh, the conventional community projects we then uh, had to look at the people uh, the human picture uh, we came up with uh, a character we had uh, a lady called uh, Gloria Ahmed Rani she was, she was displaced from her home in South Sudan and she has been in the camp for around 12 years. So she became our main character on which we would do uh, follow-ups, but also uh, doing it on other beneficiaries, but she was the main character. So we also uh, had a component of themes helping us to identify the emotions of the people we are dealing with. For instance, during this period, uh, there was hunger, there was despair, and there was little hope. But with our intervention, uh, we also uh, came in with a bit of uh, encouraging courage because uh, much as uh, they were facing these challenges, they were willing to participate in our trainings and also have hope that if indeed they implement uh, the knowledge given to them, there could be a change in their lives. So we uh, also had a component of tools. Uh, our story, the first one, uh, remained at a level of a suspense because after training, that is where our story ended and someone couldn't know what happened next. But yeah, it keeps you waiting to know uh, what will happen next. So after the, the project and the implementation, 
we went back to the community recently and captured all uh, the achievements, the challenges, um, the lessons, but also the calls to action because uh, this was a small scale intervention given that the uh, funding was small and we hope to uh, scale this. So uh, in our next part of the story, we will share the impact and the call to action. Thank you. Thanks, great, great, uh, bright. Thank you. So it's time to write another story, I guess, for you. Uh, and, and like round up the suspense, like solve the suspense for all of us. And great, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions in chat, but if there are any, we'll come back. And there's always the breakout rooms where we can discuss more details. So uh, thanks, right? Uh, with that, I think I hand over to Linda, who will now uh, sort of explain the the resilience platform tool and and basically break down how to use it because it's it's something that can that that attempts to uh, allow allow the storytellers or the interviewee interviewers or potentially even implementers to directly upload stuff themselves. So over to you, Linda, uh, to take us through this. All right, thank you so much, Shuchi, for the intro. So my name is Linda Nsifo. I work at GRP as the Monitoring, Valuation and Learning Officer. And I'll just, as Shuchi said, take you through the resilience platform. So, um, well, for the sake of those who were not at the beginning, when Shuchi talked about the Resilience Knowledge Collision, I'd like to mention that the Resilience Platform is supported by the Resilience Knowledge Collision. And it's essentially a network of networks, which consists of individual members that are hosted by the Global Resilience Partnership and co-led by a number of organizations, namely the South South North, the Climate Development Knowledge Network, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and then the least developed countries, universities consortium on climate change. And basically they play a, an active role in um, sharing information and knowledge on resilience programming, on policy and investments with um, their members. And um, Shuchi already shared the link. So if you'd like to learn more about um, the Resilience Knowledge Collision or you'd like to join, um, please feel free to um, click on the link and you'll be added to the mailing list. Um, so in terms of statistics, um, currently the Resilience Knowledge Coalition has a membership of over 560 members um, from over 100 organizations. All right, so let's dive into the Resilience Platform. So this is basically the outline that I will follow. Um, so just to give you an overview generally um, and show you the public and private views of the platform. Okay, so what really is the Resilience Platform? So basically it's an online space for capturing, accessing, co-creating and advancing the latest resilience knowledge. So when you arrive at the Resilience Platform, um, you first of all, access the resilience resources by selecting a tab, uh, which is uh, resilience resources, and then you'd be brought to this interactive map. In terms of navigation, um, when you hover your mouse over any um, country of interest, so for example here, I've decided to zero in on India, you'd see the total number of uh, resources that have been uploaded from India, which is 24. And then you'd also see a breakdown of the other resilience resources, which are categorized as solutions, stories, initiatives, evidence, and tools. So once you do that, you should see a list of the resilience resources, and then you can zero in on the one that is of interest to you. Um, so you just see a list per page, and then you can just um, click and read um, to get the information you, you want. Alternatively, you can also select your resilience resource by using the filtration functions on the, on the left side of your screen. So you'd see a number of criteria, namely themes, approaches, region of operation, um, and then after you've selected your region of operation, you get um, to filter based on the country and then also um, implementing partners. So in this example, I've zeroed in on Africa. 
So you'd see that um, the countries in Africa are highlighted. And then you can focus on a particular country of interest in Africa. So after you do that, you see a list of the various resources that have been uploaded, and then you can click and read and derive the information you need. Okay, so how do we sign up? How do you register? So first of all, you come to the homepage of the Resilience Platform, and then you'd see a button on the top right corner of your screen, uh, which is the sign up button. So you click that, and then you'll be directed to this page where you can enter your details. So you have to enter your username, your first name, your last name, your organization's name, and then your email address. And then you click the sign up button, after which you'll receive an email, uh, which would give you further instructions on how you can verify your account. And then afterwards, you'll be brought to your profile. So um, here is my profile. Um, so afterwards, you can proceed with um, whatever you want to do, be it a loading your resources. But before that, I just want to touch on how you can reset your password. So initially when you sign up, you're given a password which is generated by the platform. And um, sometimes it's a bit difficult to remember the password that you initially receive. So in order to reset your password and to have a password that you can easily remember, you come back to the platform and then you'd click uh, log in and then you'd be brought to this um, page where you can enter your username. And then afterwards you click the forgot your password um, button, and then you can proceed with the instructions on how to reset your password. And then from then you can use that password to log in anytime you need to upload a resource on the resilience platform. Okay, so the focus today is on stories. And um, yes, my previous speakers have already done a brief brilliant um, you know, introduction as to what goes into storytelling. So in order to upload a story um, onto the Resilience platform, um, you click on the Stories button. Um, that's after you've logged in. And here I'm just showing you um, how you can focus on maybe a story that probably you are interested in from a particular country. So here again, I've selected um, India. So after you've uploaded your story, you'd see that um, the stories in, are indicated uh, when you select a particular country. Um, so let's continue. Um, so after you've selected or you've indicated that you want to um, upload a story, you'd see a button here which says add new story. And then you would be brought to this page which is the template for uploading a story. But before you can proceed, you need to um, read the terms and conditions and also um, the privacy policy um, document, just so that you provide your consent that you're willing to share vital information and um, that you're ready to um, yeah, disclose any sensitive information that may come in the form of images um, or names and so on. Yeah. So to move forward, um, you click yes or you indicate yes, and then you can proceed by providing your details in the form. So um, firstly, you'd have to provide a title of your resource, and then you provide the name of the respondent, um, more or less like the one that the story is focused on, and then the community or the organization the person is from, and then um, the type of organization. And then also um, you have to provide a story summary. So please um, take note of the the character limit, uh, make sure that you don't exceed the 2000 character limit. And as you can see, um, you'd notice that there's a red asterisk, um, which has been allocated to some of the fields, which means that those fields are mandatory. And so um, you can't upload your story if you don't provide um, details um, within those fields. And as you proceed, you'd see that some fields are also not mandatory, like the donors field. Um, so if you don't have information about donors, you don't necessarily have to um, provide that information. Okay, so moving on, um, you can provide your theme, you can provide the approach, and then also the SDGs that are being addressed um, in your story. And then you can continue with the story itself. So um, you need to 
break down your stories um, into paragraphs. So the way the platform is, is built is such that you can um, divide your stories into various blocks. So you can provide um, your title and then you provide the main paragraphs afterwards. And if you have multiple paragraphs, all you have to do is to click the plus button here and you'll be able to add as many um, paragraphs or blocks to your story. Um, and again, just to remind um, you to just take note of the 2000 character limit um, so that you, your text is not truncated when you're um, you know, building your story. Okay, so um, moving forward, then you can provide the contact information of the authors. If you happen to be the author, you can provide your information um, and then you can proceed with providing media files. So if you have media files um, linked to your story, then you can upload them as well in the form of photos, documents, or videos, and um, thumbnails. And also please take note of the um, upload file limit, which is um, less, it should be less than 100 megabytes. So anything more than 100 megabytes will not be um, uploaded successfully onto the platform. Okay, so once you provide all your media files, then you can come to the end of the form by providing your source. Um, so if this um, story that you're uploading is from a source um, that you, you want to reference, then you'd have to type it in here. And then afterwards you can submit. Um, if you think the story needs some extra work, um, then you can save it as a draft and come back to it later and finalize it. Okay, so I would like to also introduce you to the documents that are available if you need to um, acquaint yourself more with the platform. So there are a number of documents that you can access, such as the partners documentation and then the resilience platform FAQs. So just to mention that everyone who um, signs onto the platform is automatically a partner. Um, so basically you're contributing knowledge um, onto the platform, hence um, why you're considered a partner. And with that, um, I'd like to also mention that, um, yes, feel free to reach out by email. Um, so you can reach out to me um, for anything related to content. Um, you can send me an email um, to L in CIFL at globalresiliencepartnership.org or for any technical questions, you can address them to support at ona.io. And with that, I would like to say thank you for your attention and we look forward to taking action together with you. So if there are any questions you may ask now or we can also have them addressed during the breakout session. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Linda. That was great. Uh, I don't see any questions just yet on chat, uh, but I can request June to now uh, put us into breakout rooms and let's discuss, break down uh, storytelling a little more and discuss a little more detail on storytelling. Thank you. I think uh, I think people have received uh, like an invite to join a room. So Can I, uh, like, are you having issues uh, in joining? Just feel free to, to let me know. And, and, and I guess uh, accept, uh, there's a prompt that will come on your screen. Please accept it so that you can be able to join a breakout room. Thank <laughs> you. 
Akane and, and Nagisa is, is uh, okay, sure. Okay, sorry. Hi, Alice. Uh, Excuse us, I would like. Uh, did you receive an invite to join a breakout room? Would you like to join one? Or are you having any issues joining? Yeah, my network, my network is a bit bad. But I can have, you can send the invite again, which came, but I couldn't join. Okay. And now, mm -hmm. not yet. Let me. Alice, is like, uh, are, you, are you still having challenges? Maybe, I don't know, if you can drop out and then come back and then I try to add you again in a breakout room. And then, yeah, I can, I, can, I can take you back. Okay, I think you're doing. Hi, June. Hi, I've, I've been like a few people are still joining, so I'm trying okay. to, yeah, to just be here so that in case they join, I move them into record rooms. You need help? No, 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 it's it's cool. It's I'm okay. I'm good. fine. Yeah. All right, you're good, right? Yeah, yeah. Great. Good to hear. I'll join the other breakout room for a bit and then uh, come back. Yeah. Okay. I think you can be able to just move. Yeah, I'll do it myself. Yes, thanks.
parachute is a, is a I, I had a question. So I should stop the I should uh, close the breakout rooms in um I think for now it's like in 17 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just just leave final five minutes for reflections and five five minutes for um uh, for like closing and wrapping up. And um yeah, I think just a second, give me a second. Um, yeah so just uh just to add that we have two very different sets of conversations happening in the two breakout rooms so i'll go back to mine this is two <laughs> very different kinds of audiences we have very senior people from like very big ngos in one and we have like uh younger people in another group so it just makes sense to have two very different kinds of <laughs> considers because i just put them to go automatic and then i just that's fine <laughs> yeah that's fine i think anyway i'll head to the other breakout room see you
Hi, hi, Michael. Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. We were having, we have had, I think we've had two very different sets of conversations from both groups uh, and very happy to have everyone back. Uh, we can quickly take five minutes to report back from both sessions. So, uh, Melina, Linda, would you, one of you would like to go first? Uh, Linda, I can see you're unmuted already. So, if you'd like to go first. Okay, um, yeah, we had an interesting session. Um, yeah, we got timed out, but I mean, nevertheless, we got like very nice um, contributions from, from our participants. Um, so I recall that uh, one of our participants shared something about um, a story that had to do with um, uh, pastoralist, um, someone in in the heat of you know 
climate change impacts and you know finding an alternative uh, means of livelihood um so this person started well the this person got trained um into um you know developing herself in terms of sewing and also started selling um, jewelry mats and clothes and actually when she was sharing she pointed us to one of um, a pair of the earrings that um, she had actually got from this lady that she interviewed which was really um, nice to hear um, yeah I think that was one story that really stood out to me um, Belina do you have anyone that really stood out to you I think every story was like different in terms of like one was more on like climate change perspective. I think Lena's uh, experience in her field work had more to do with policy failures or uh, mostly like intervention failure that um, was in her field work where she talked about um, how a particular uh, project was failed due to some uh, lack of monitoring criteria that they did not look into a local perspective but um, it was quite interesting that the people there were bold enough to take out some elements uh, from the project and use only that's uh, the same line that she said I'm just like repeating and quote unquote she said that um, they picked up the elements from the project that worked for them and just threw aside the things that didn't work for them and I think that's that was very bold of them to do that and it was quite interesting where she shared that um, it turned into a success story and uh, I think we also discussed on how uh, most of these policies and projects um, that are in the developing countries especially will only look at the larger framework and do not see into um, taking care of the local perspective or and yeah, that's what we discussed, and I think it was a very meaningful conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. That's super useful. I think you've got some interesting stories, and, and uh, I hope you are planning to reach out to them. You've got, you've got Lena's and others' uh, details, contact details, and I hope you can, uh, we can have more uploads in the next few months maybe if not the next few weeks on the platform so please feel free to use the platform we on the other hand in our session uh, in our breakout room had some very interesting conversations and emma you can please fill in uh here and maybe i can stick to the conversations around the conundrum of of resilience measurement and it's great that we are in cba talking about lived experiences talking about stories as a way to measure but then globally um there is a push to have one single goal for adaptation there's there's a push to focus on uh measuring indicator based measurement around around adaptation and and i'm just simplifying everything for audiences who may not already know of these these issues but uh we had some we had some discussions around how or who the audiences are how how do we measure for the audiences for the stakeholders and uh who should we be influencing and and um uh, how does the power dynamics of top-down um uh, indicator driven resilience measurement approaches affect uh the way we are measuring locally led adaptation so very exciting very different set of conversations because we didn't get into the storytelling more because we were fewer people and we felt like this would be more useful, but we had great conversations. So thank you, Jamie, Marit, uh, Bright, and Emma for being part of those conversations. Emma, do you have anything else that I may have missed out on? No, I think you captured it well, Sushi. Great, thanks. And with that, I'm very, very grateful that all of you have stayed behind. We've, we've got full, I mean, most people tend to move out at the time of breakout rooms but people have stayed have had interesting conversations and i hope you found so the intention for this workshop was also to um to introduce and invite you to use the resilience platform and the other ways we are telling stories uh as well as sort of 
share spotlight and and shed spotlight on uh the the amazing work that um that many interventions such as brights are are doing and and the way that has been sort of structured uh so yeah so that was that was largely the intention of the workshop and i'm very grateful for the conversations we've had hoping to take them forward and hoping to seeing a lot of your work being also being published on the platform and and hoping to take conversations on resilience measurement forward into cop so we do have a session at cop on resilience measurement where you're more than welcome so this is on the resilience hub um and it's all virtual as well as in person so a lot of hybrid sessions it's free to attend so please look up cop resilience hub and do attend uh, a the session is on november 10th at 12 noon um egypt time because this is this is happening in sharm el sheikh egypt this day so yeah you're more than welcome for the 12 days of cop to join us thank you